Hi, everyone. I see uh, people are joining. Uh, welcome to our final session of the great books uh, for 2022 as we complete uh, Georgie's uh, exposition on Montaigne. I just wanted to take a few minutes to greet everybody and thank you for a wonderful year. Uh, thank you for your ongoing support of Ubiquity University and Humanity Rising and our Wisdom School and all the good things that we continue day by day to try to bring to you as our uh, community of learners. Uh, it is such a privilege really, uh, for Georgie and I uh, to be uh, able to uh, work with you on everything from your dissertations to your various courses. We're busy putting up uh, the 2023 courses for the January trimester and into the May uh, trimester. I think you'll find it exciting. We have an extraordinary program uh, for uh, the great books. That's all mapped out. And as you know, it's up on our website so you can uh, sign up and be part of it. This is the one course that is open both for students uh, but also lifelong learners as a just a community service uh, for uh, our larger community. So I want to thank everyone. And now with great pleasure, <laughs> I would love to introduce my very good friend and colleague uh, uh, who uh, uh, I've had wonderful adventures with over the years. And uh, you all know her, Georgie Zabo. Georgie. Uh, thank you, dear Jim. And a warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Can't believe this is the last session of 2022 of the Great Books course. Wow, well, as you um, joined us uh, last time, we reviewed um, Michel de Montaigne's life and uh, what he was doing besides uh, reading and writing and how he uh, is considered as a Proto blogger, indeed, he was, I think, and uh, we reviewed um, also what others uh, said about him, how he influenced the uh, scholars, politicians, philosophers, uh, thinkers, lay people, and so forth. Um, I'd um, actually, what I would like to ask Georg, you have my um, PowerPoint presentation, would you? actually mind uh, maybe sharing it uh, with the group, not right now, but I, I thought that I switched some of my applications off, but it seems I haven't, and I don't want uh, to have any uh, any disturbance whatsoever. So um, thank you very much for doing that, Gail. I really, really appreciate it. You want it. me to share a screen or you want me to send them the, 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 the oh, PowerPoint? Oh, share screen, just the first slide. That would be really wonderful. Thank you very much. I would appreciate that. So what we will do today is that I have chosen a special essay. Uh, I was I was going through the whole book, which, you know, if you read the book, uh, over 700 pages, that there are plenty of exciting uh, uh, essays in it. Uh, but I, I kept going back to one, which is on friendship. And uh, I can't wait to discuss uh, uh, the whole concept with you at the end. What I did uh, for this uh, presentation, like I did last time, is that uh, I um, kind of like uh, uh, just chosen uh, the words of the um, translator, because as you may remember we discussed that the translator is super important. This book was published in 1580, written in, in Old French. And the first uh, translation was in uh, Old English, which is super, super hard to read. Uh, anyway, for me it was, but I managed to find this uh, translation, which I, I sent you last time. In case you don't have it, please let me know at the end. I can share with you the uh, the the ebook uh, link with you. So I will start with um, with the uh, preface of the um, translator, then then the special selection that I've chosen, I'm going to read it to you. Then at the end, I'm going to share my comments and the comments of some scholars such as Nixie Adams and some other people and share some slides at the very end. And then we get into a discussion. So all you need to do now is um, sit back, relax, and listen to my Hango English on Montaigne about friendship. So this I, can, can you sharing the slides or should I turn them off for now? No, it is it is fine. Just leave it as it is. Go. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So this is the um, unaffectionate relationship. And uh, these few words uh, are from uh, the translator Screech. So he said the following, this chapter, the l'amitié is traditionally called on friendship, but in Renaissance French, amitié includes many affectionate relationships, ranging from a father's love for his child to friendly services of a doctor or lawyer, to that conjugal love felt by Montaigne for his wife, and to that rarest of lasting friendship which Montaigne shared with La Boitier. Several terms are needed in English to render these different senses. They include friendship, loving friendship, benevolence, affection, affectionate relationships, and love. The basic meaning of amitié is rooted in aimer in French, to love. But it often excludes amour, a love, between the sexes and always the mad love, which was sexual and extramarital. The first syllable of amitié was fully nasalized in Renaissance French. It therefore sounds like am, soul. Since ancient times, philosophy had classified love between the sexes as at least primarily an affair of the other, lower part of man, the body. Some Renaissance Platonists were concerned to modify this stark dichotomy between soul love and body love. Much was written on parfait amitié, a perfect loving relationship, which could arise between a man and a woman in which physical love was relegated to a vital but second place. Montaigne does not underplay the role of sexual love, but despite classical precedent, he does wonder whether the fully sexual love plus a fully soul-centered amitié could not bind an exceptional man to an exceptional woman. If it could, then it would engage the whole individual person, body and soul. That would indeed be perfect love. Male homosexual love, which did from Socratic times claim to do just that, does not disturb nor preoccupy Montaigne. He dismisses it as justly abhorrent to our manners mm -hmm. and as a parody of heterosexual love. But philosophical homosexuality shows mutatis mutandis, what the love of man and woman could ideally be, a marriage of bodies and souls. Montaigne's main concern is with the very special loving friendship which he shared with Etienne de La Boitier. La Boitier's youthful treatise on willing slavery, which praised the polity of the Republic of Venice at the expense of monarchy, was used seditiously after his death by those who had taken up arms against the king in the wars of religion. Montaigne is at pains to show that a rare and exemplary friendship has ever been consonant with loyalty to the state and that both he and, and La Boitier were loyal to each other and therefore loyal to their country. Now I'm going to read Montaigne's words. There seems to be nothing for which nature has better prepared us than for fellowship. And Aristotle says that good lawgivers have shown more concerns for friendship than for justice. Within a fellowship, the peak of, of perfection consists in friendship. For all forms of it which are forged or fostered by pleasure or profit, or by public or private necessity are so much less beautiful and noble, and therefore so much less friendship, in that they bring in some purpose and or fruition other than the friendship itself. Nor do those four ancient species of love conform to it, the natural, the social, the hospitable, and the erotic. 
from children to fathers, it is more a matter of respect, friendship, being fostered by mutual confidences, cannot exist between them because of their excessive inequality. It might also interfere with their natural obligations, for all the secret thoughts of fathers cannot be shared with their children for fear of begetting an unbecoming intimacy. Neither can those counsels and abonitions which constitute one of the principal obligations of friendship be offered by children to their fathers. There have been peoples where it was the custom for children to kill their fathers and others for fathers to kill their children to avoid the impediment which each can constitute for the other. One depends naturally on the downfall of the other. The name of the brother is truly a fair one and full of love. That is why La Boatie and I made a brotherhood of our alliance. But sharing out property or dividing it up with the wealth of one becoming the poverty of the other can wondrously melt and weaken the soldier binding brothers together. Brothers have to progress and advance by driving along the same path in the same convoy. Their needs must frequently bump and jostle against each other. Moreover, why should there be found between them that congruity and affinity which engender true and perfect friendship? Father and son can be of totally different complexions. So can brothers. He is my son, he is my kinsman, but he is wild, wicked, or draft. And to the extent that they are loving relationships commanded by the law and the bonds of nature, there is less of our own choice, less willing freedom. Our willing freedom produces nothing more properly its own than affection and loving friendship. It is not that I have failed to essay all that the other kind can afford, having had the best father who ever was and the most indulgent even into extreme old age and coming as I do from the family renowned and exemplary from generation to generation in a matter of brotherly harmony. You cannot compare with friendship the passion men feel for women, even though it is born of our own choice, nor can you put them into the same category. I must admit that the flames of passion are more active, sharp, and keen, but that fire is a rash one, fickle, fluctuating, and variable. It is a feverish fire, subject to attacks and relapses, which only gets hold of a comer of us. The love of friends is a general, universal warmth, temperate, moreover, and smooth, a warmth which is constant and at rest, all gentleness and evenness, having nothing sharp nor keen. What is more, sexual love is but a mad craving for something which escapes us. As soon as it enters the territory of friendship, where wills work together, that is, it languishes and grows faint. To enjoy, it is to lose. Its end is in the body and therefore subject to satiety. Friendship, on the contrary, is enjoyed in proportion to our desire, since it is a matter of the mind with our souls being purified by practicing it. It can spring forth, be nourished and grow only when enjoyed. Far below such perfect relationship, those fickle passions also once found a place in me, not to mention in La Boitier, who confesses to all too many in his verses. And so those who emotions came into me, each one aware of the other, but never to be compared. 
the first maintaining its course in a proud and lofty flight, scornfully watching the other racing a long way down below. As for marriage, apart from being a bargain where only the entrance is free, its duration being fettered and constrained, depending on things outside our will, it is a bargain struck for other purposes. Within it, you soon have the unsnare hundreds of extraneous tangled ends, which are enough to break the thread of a living passion and to trouble its course. Whereas in friendship, there is no traffic or commerce, but with itself. In addition, women are in truth, not normally capable of responding to such familiarity and mutual confidence as sustain that holy bond of friendship, nor do their souls seem firm enough to withstand the clasp of a knot so lasting and so tightly drawn. And indeed, if it were not for that, if it were possible to fashion such a relationship, willing and free, in which not only the souls had this full enjoyment, but in which the bodies too shared in the union, where the whole human being was involved, it is certain that the loving friendship would be more full and more abundant. But there is no example yet of woman attaining to it. And by the common agreement of the ancient schools of philosophy, she is excluded from it. Moreover, what we normally call friends and friendships are no more than acquaintances and familiar relationships bound by some chance and some suitability by means of which our souls support each other. In the friendship which I'm talking about, souls are mingled and confounded in so universal a blending that they affect the seam which joins them together so that it cannot be found. If you press me to say why I loved him, I feel that it cannot be expressed except by replying, because it was him, because it was me. Mediating this union there was beyond all my reasoning, beyond all that I can say specifically about it, some inexpl inexplicable force of destiny. We were seeking each other before we set eyes on each other, both because of the reports we each had heard, which made a more violent assault on our emotions than was reasonable, for what they had said, and I believe because of some decree of heaven, we embraced each other by repute and at our first meeting, we chanced to be at a great crowded town festival, we discovered ourselves to be so seized by each other, so known to each other and so bound together that from then on, none was so close, each was to the other. He wrote an excellent Latin satire, which has been published, by which he defends and explains the suddenness of our relationship, which so quickly reached perfection. Having so short a period to last, having begun so late, for we were both grown men, he more than a few years older than I, it had no time to waste on following the pattern of those slacker ordinary friendships which require so much prudent foresight in long preliminary acquaintance. This friendship has had no ideal to follow other than itself, no comparison but with itself. There is no one particular consideration, nor two, nor three, nor four, nor a thousand of them, but rather some inexplicable quintessence of them all mixed up together, which, having captured my will, brought it to plunge into his and lose itself, and which, having captured his will, brought it to plunge and lose itself in mine with an equal hunger and emulation. I say, lose itself 
In very truth, we kept nothing back from ourselves. Nothing was his or mine. In the presence of the Roman consuls, who after the condemnation of Tiberius Gracchus, were prosecuting those who had been in his confidence, Laelius eventually asked Caius Blosius, the closest friend of Gracchus, how much he would have done for him. He replied, anything. What, anything? Laelius continued, and what if he had ordered you to set fire to our temples? He would have never asked me to, retorted Blosius. But, so, but supposing he had, Laelius added, then I would have obeyed, he replied. Now, if he really were so perfect a friend of Gracchus, as history asserts, he had no business provoking the consuls with that last rash assertion and ought never to have abandoned the certainty he had of the wishes of Gracchus. But those who condemn his reply as seditious do not fully understand the mystery of friendship and fail to accept the premise that he had Gracchus's intentions in the pocket of his sleeve, both by his influence and by his knowledge. They were more friends than citizens, friends more than friends or foes of their country or friends of ambition and civil strife. Having completely committed themselves to each other, they each completely held the reins of each other's desires. Grant that their pair were guided by virtue and led by reason, without which it is impossible to harness them together, Blosius' reply is what it should have been. If their actions broke the traces, then they were, by my measure, neither friends of each other nor friends of themselves. Moreover, that reply sounds no different than mine would be. If I were interrogated thus, if your will commanded you to kill your daughter, would you kill her? And I said that I would, for that is no witness that I would consent to do so because I do not doubt what my will is any more than I doubt the will of such a friend. All the arguments in the world have no power to dislodge me from the certainty which I have of the intentions and decisions of my friend. Not one of his act actions could be set before me, no matter what it looked like, without my immediately discovering its motive. Our souls were yoked together in such unity and contemplated each other with so ardent an affection and with the same affection revealed each to each other right down to the very entrails that not only did I know his mind as well as I knew my own, but I would have entrusted myself to him with greater assurance than to myself. Let nobody place those other common friends in the same rank as this. I know about them, the most perfect of their kind, as well as anyone else, but I would advise you not to confound their rules. You would deceive yourself. In those other friendships, you must proceed with wisdom and caution, keeping the reins in your hand. The bond is not so well tied that there is no reason to doubt it. Love a friend, said Chilo, as though someday you must hate him, hate him, as though you must love him. That precept, which is so detestable in that sovereign master friendship is salutary in the practice of the friendships which are common and customary in relation to which you must employ that saying which Aristotle often repeated, oh, my friends, there is no friend. In this noble relationship, the services and goods and good turns which foster those other friendships 
do not even merit being taken into account. That is because of the total interfusion of our wills. For just as the friendly love I feel for myself is not increased, no matter what the Stoics may say. By any help I give myself in my need, and just as I feel no gratitude for any good turn I do to myself, so too the union of such friends, being truly perfect, leads them to lose any awareness of such services, to hate, and to drive out from between them all terms of division and difference, such as good turn, duty, gratitude, request, thanks, and the like. Everything is genuinely common to them both, their wills, goods, wives, children, honor, and lives. Their correspondence is that of one soul in bodies twain according to that most apt definition of Aristotle's. So they can neither lend nor give anything to each other. That is why those who make laws forbid gifts between husband and wife, so as to honor marriage with some imagined resemblance to that holy bond, wishing to infer by it that everything must belong to them both, so that there is nothing to divide or to split up between them. In the kind of friendship I'm talking about, if it were possible for one to give to the other, it is the one who received the benefaction of uh, the benefaction who would lay an obligation on his companion. For each of them, more than anything else, is seeking the good of the other, so that the one who furnishes the means and the occasion is in fact the more generous since he gives his friend the joy of performing for him what he most desires. When Diogenes, the philosopher, was short of money, he did not say that he would ask his friends to give him some, but to give him some back. And to show how this happens in practice, I will cite an example, a unique one from antiquity. Eudamidas, a Corinthian, had two friends, Xorixanus, a Sicilian, and Areteus, also a Corinthian. As he happened to die in poverty, his two friends, being rich, he made the following statement to Areteus. I bequeath that he look after my mother and maintain her in her old age, and to Xorixanus that he see that my daughter be married, providing her with the largest dowry he can. And if one of them should chance to die, I appoint the survivor to substitute for him. Those who first saw his will laughed at it, but when those hares learned of it, they accepted it with a unique joy. One of them, Xorixanus, did die five days later. The possibility of substitution was thus opened in favor of Areteus, and he looked after the mother with much care. Then, of 500 weight of silver in his possession, he gave two and a half for the marriage of his only daughter and two and a half for the daughter of Eudamidas, celebrating their weddings on the same day. This example is the most full one, save for one circumstance. There was more than one friend. For the perfect friendship, which I am talking about, is in, indivisible. Each gives himself so entirely to his friend that he has nothing left to share with another. On the contrary, he grieves that he is not twofold, threefold, or fourfold, and that he does not have several souls, several wheels, so that he could give them all to the one he loves. Common friendships can be shared. In one friend, one can love beauty. In another, affability. In another, generosity. In another, a fatherly affection. In another, a brotherly love, and so on. But in this friendship, 
love takes possession of the soul and reigns there with full sovereign sway that cannot possibly be duplicated. If two friends ask you to have them at the same time, which of them would you dash to? If they asked for conflicting flavors, who would have the priority? If one entrusted to your silence something which it was useful for the other to know, how would you get out of that? The unique highest friendship loosens all other bonds. That secret which I have sworn to reveal to no other, I can reveal without perjury to him who is not another. He is me. It is a great enough miracle for oneself to be redoubled. They do not realize how high a one it is when they talk of its being tripled. The uttermost cannot be matched. If anyone suggests that I can love each of two friends as much as the other, and that they can love each other and love me as much as I love them, he is turning into plural, into confraternity, that which is the most one, the most bound into one. One single example of it is moreover the rarest thing to find in the world. The rest of that story conforms well what I was saying, for Eudamidas bestows a grace and favor on his friends when he makes use of them in his necessity. He left them hairs to his own generosity, which consists in putting into their hands the means of doing him good. And there is no doubt that the force of loving friendship is more richly displayed in what he did than in what Arateos did. To sum up, these are deeds which surpass the imagination of anyone who has not tasted them. In those alliances which only get hold of us by one end, we need simply to provide against such flows as specifically affect that end. It cannot matter to me what the religion of my doctor or my lawyer is. That consideration has nothing in common with the friendly services, services which they owe to me. And in such commerce as arises at home with my servants, I act the same way. I make few inquiries about the chastity of my footman. I want to know if he is hardworking. I'm less concerned by a mule driver who gambles than by one who is an idiot or by a cook who swears than by one who is incompetent. It is not my concern to tell the world how to behave, plenty of others do that, but how I behave in it. For the intimate companionship of my table, I choose the agreeable, not the wise. In my bed, beauty comes before virtue. In social conversation, ability even without integrity, and so on. <clears throat> In antiquity, Menander pronounced a man to be happy if he had merely encountered the shadow of a friend. He was certainly right to say so, especially if he had actually tasted friendship. For in truth, if I compare all the rest of my life, although by the grace of God, I have lived it sweetly and easily, exempt, same, save for the death of such a friend, from grievous affliction, in full tranquility of mind, contenting myself with the natural endowments which I was born with, and not going about looking for others. If I compare it, I say, to those four years which it was vouchsafed to me to enjoy in a sweet companionship and fellowship of a man like that, it is but smoke and ashes, a night dark and dreary. Since that day when I lost him, which I shall ever hold bitter to me, though always honor since the gods ordained it so, I merely drag wearily on. The very pleasures which are preferred me do not console me. 
They redouble my sorrow at his loss. In everything we were halves, I feel I am stealing his share from him, nor is it right for me to enjoy pleasures I decided while he who shares things with me is absent from me. I was already so used and accustomed to being in everything, one of two, that now I feel I am no more than a half, since an ultimately blow has borne away a part of my soul. Why do I still linger on less there, only partly surviving? That day was the downfall of us both. There is no deed nor thought in which I do not miss him, as he would have missed me, for just as he infinitely surpassed me in ability and virtue, so did he do so in the offices of friendship. What shame or limit should there be to grieve for one so dear? How wretched I am, having lost such a brother with you, died all, your joy, all our joys, which your sweet love fostered when you were alive. You, brother. Oops. Oh, oh can we get back? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you, brother, have destroyed my happiness by your death. All my soul is buried with you. Because of your loss, I have chased all thoughts from my mind and all pleasures from my soul. Shall I never speak to you, never hear you talking of what you have done? Shall I never see you again, my brother, dearer than life itself? But certainly I shall love you always. And this is where I'm going to uh, end Montaigne's words. And now I would like to share just a brief commentary on this section. Montaigne differentiates between ordinary and true friendship. Ordinary friendships or mere acquaintanceships are those relationships we form in daily life to oil the wheels of social dis discourse and to negotiate everyday life and navigate its various social challenges. According to Montaigne, these friendships are friendships of convention or utility and we enter into them to make society function. We have many such superficial acquaintances or professional relationships with work colleagues, but we may not truly connect with them on a deeper spiritual level and therefore may not derive any spiritual fulfillment from them. While Aristotle considered a friend as another self, Friendship is defined by Montaigne as a spiritual experience where one soul finds itself in two bodies and reconnects to such an extent that even death becomes irrelevant. In fact, Montaigne considered only true friendship of the type he described as an end in itself, while all other types of friendship were merely means to a particular end. A true friend, according to Montaigne, fulfilled multiple roles for the other person. La Boatier, for example, seemed to function at one time or another as Montaigne's father, brother, friend, and beloved. Why Montaigne clearly contrasted true friendship with family, sexual, and romantic relationship his conception of friendship seemed to define a superior relationship that fulfills all of these diverse and by themselves inferior roles in one single, a special relationship characterized by wholeness, perfection, uniqueness, and spirituality. Further, Montaigne posits that such a spiritual friendship is akin to a meeting of soulmates, an extremely rare experience. He himself had found such a perfect friendship in his relationship with Etienne de la Boitier, and as he considered it irreplaceable and a unique once in a lifetime event, 
Montaigne made no efforts to find a new true friend after La Boitier's death. Interestingly, Montaigne believed that the kind of true friendship he envisaged and claimed to have experienced with La Boitier could only take place between two males, not between a male and a female, and he provided two reasons for this theory. Firstly, Montaigne deemed women to be intellectually incapable of forming such a close and genuine bond. Considering the time in which Montaigne wrote his essays, such an option is understandable, understandable and makes sense in light of the general belief, educational and cultural systems in place at the time. We therefore cannot look at this aspect under the modern lens of today, but shall accept it as accurate from Montaigne's perspective at the time he wrote of friendship in a period around 1580. Men and women could therefore only engage in purely sexual relationships or form romantic unions, including marriage, but not experienced through friendship. Secondly, Montaigne posited that in contrast to the ancient Greek conventions, homosexual relations between males are to be frowned upon, which was also a typical attitude prevalent at that time. Montaigne explains that in his view, the ideal friendship would be a male-male friendship that also includes a sexual aspect for the physical union would make the union of the soul even more perfect. In contrast to the traditional male-female relationship, Montaigne further stresses that the goal of any physical union in a sense <clears throat> of perfect friendship is pure pleasure, not reproduction, which he considers one of the utilitarian purposes of marriage as homosexuality was considered immoral, though Montaigne had to settle for the next best possible definition of friendship, which was a true friend of virtue between two males without any sexual involvement. In today's terms, we would liken such a relationship to an intimate bromance. A further important aspect of Montaigne's conception of friendship is that of involuntary attraction. Unlike Cicero and Aristotle, for example, Montaigne thought of friendship not as something that is actively pursued, but rather as an inexplicable phenomenon that happens to two persons involuntarily without them having any choice in the matter. However, according to this concept, <clears throat> friendship is not a love of properties of the other person, in other words, hesiety love, but rather a love for the person itself and who they really are. The other person's traits are specifically not the foundation for the friendship here. When questioned about his reasons, for his friendship with La Boitier, Montaigne famously stated, if one were to press me to say why I loved him, I fear that this cannot be expressed because it was he, because it was I. This suggests that there was a mutual attraction to the very essence of the other person rather than the mere attraction of Montaigne to La Boitier's features and traits and vice versa. This description also ties in with the already discussed claim of Montaigne that his experience of friendship with La Boitier was entirely involuntary and not a rational choice. Furthermore, Montaigne posited that it is only possible to have one true friend in one's lifetime and that it is impossible to repeat or recreate this experience with other people. And that another relationship is merely a casual friendship that can never reach the depths 
of the true friendship described by him. In fact, according to Montaigne, a participant in a true friendship gives himself so wholly to his friend that he has nothing left to distribute elsewhere. Loyalty to one's one and the only true friend is therefore of major importance for Montaigne, so important that it should cause one to defy all norms. And he describes it. A true friend should put his best friend above all else and be loyal to him above anyone else. According to Montaigne, having multiple friends would create conflict as these friends may have conflicting interests and it would not be clear who should be put first. If there is only one main friend though, who commands and deserves loyalty above all else, this conflict does not arise. Some contemporary scholars might dismiss Montaigne's concept of friendship purely on the basis of it seemingly being at least to some degree homophobic and misogynistic. However, Montaigne's works and ideas need to be considered against the backdrop of the prevailing ideas, social norms, and cultural conditions of his time, which, was which were naturally very different from our modern times. His ideas should therefore not be dismissed outright on this basis, although they may conflict with modern societal norms and ideas. His idea that souls can connect without any need for a romantic or sexual relationship is certainly plausible. The fact that Montaigne suggests such true friendships are rare once in a lifetime events are also plausible. Due to geographical and social restrictions, meeting such a soulmate must by nature be a rare event. Although we may have a multiple of what Montaigne would term casual friendships, ranging from sports to professional to social contexts, it is rare that we truly connect with another person and feel that we are one soul in two bodies, as Montaigne had described it. That one should feel love for such a person, but not necessarily a sexual attraction, is also only natural. Although we do, of course, recall that Montaigne considered a sexless male-male relationship, friendship, only the second best option. The question, therefore, arises whether Montaigne really had the desire to lead a homosexual relationship with La Boitier. <clears throat> However, although Montaigne does praise relationship that combines physical with the spiritual union as the ideal friendship, he ultimately rejects homosexual relationship between males and pederastry in particular. Taking him at face value, we must therefore assume that Montaigne did not have any sexual interest in La Boitier. In fact, one would posit that finding or desiring to find a unique soulmate for a purely platonic, close friendship without any romantic interest is perfectly plausible. And indeed, the chances of finding a soulmate on the intimate level described by Montaigne, and then additionally happening to find them physically attractive and striving for a sexual relationship must be exceedingly rare and an unimageable and very uncommon coincidence and therefore nothing to particularly strive for. Additionally, any sexual attraction is likely to fade over time, but true friendship, according to Montaigne, is not subject to such physical fluctuations, which makes it preferable. In fact, Montaigne speaks of sexual desire as a burning flame, while friendship is a warm glow, and he considers both as mutually exclusive. The fact that such friendship is a rare and unique event, as claimed by Montaigne, also appears to be true to date, 
When considering interpersonal relationships in our own environments and society at large. In today's modern society in particular, we seem to have fallen prey to the illusion of friendship above all on social media, where some individuals have thousands of friends, but barely have any true connection with them in real life at all. Today's lifestyle with remote working and the focus on online world is making it increasingly rare to find that one person to connect with and form a true friendship according to Montaigne's definition. Hence, Montaigne's distinction between friends of utility and friendship of value is also perfectly plausible and still as relevant today as in his day, if not even more. An interesting point though is Montaigne's preoccupation with La Boitier after his friend's death. Death has no relevance to Montaigne's friendship concept. In fact, Montaigne seems to elevate and idolize his friend after his death in a utopian manner while ascribing to him almost religious significance akin to Jesus Christ or Socrates. Montaigne praises his friend quite literally into heaven, almost as if the friend, he replaces the position of God. Montaigne continued his friendship with the deceased Labotier through his writings for almost three decades, in particular through the essays. In his literary works, Montaigne clearly reverses his friend and glorifies him and their friendship. Given that the two men only knew each other for approximately four years prior to Labotier's un untimely death, which is a relatively short period of time, the question arises whether the friends might have still, be, still been in a honeymoon period and not yet have gone through a more difficult patch. One might posit that, had they been acquainted for longer, cracks might have started to appear in the initially seemingly perfect friendship, and Montaigne might have revised his position on such true friendship and its existence. It is possible that Montaigne fell prey to an illusion of perfection, which was never revised due to his friend's early death, but might have changed if the man had known each other for longer than four years. His conception of friendship appears to be based on the idea of true friendship as a meeting of similar minds. The question arises whether Montaigne may have been intellectually gifted and if Laboitier was likewise gifted. As evidenced by the sophisticated writings of the two men, such an intellectual relationship would lead to a sense of coming home in the other person and feeling understood in a way a neurotypical friend or acquaintance could never offer. If this, if this was the case, Montaigne may have drawn the conclusion that this type of friendship per se may be something very unique and special that could never be matched by another person. However, this conclusion may have been down to the fact that he simply did not have the opportunity to meet many like-minded and equally gifted peers due to the rare nature of the intellectual giftedness, specifically less than 2% of the population. Further, one can argue that Montaigne's stipulation that true friendships on the soulmate level he describes are very rare indeed, in very much true, especially in today's society. One would argue that this is partly reason many individuals today choose to engage in psychotherapy and, re and replicate the elusive perfect friendship in a therapy relationship where they are guaranteed to find unconditional positive regard and love and even seeming connecting of souls or at least the illusion of it. The perfect friendship as described by Montaigne therefore does exist in therapy relationships, but the question then arises how real these relationships are and one must likely conclude 
that they are for the large part merely an illusion or idealization transference. However, while the psychotherapist may only play a part and see the relationship as a professional one, it often happens that the client views it as a genuine and true friendship as defined by Montaigne, not realizing that therapeutic alliance is not friendship. Given then Laboitier's older age and more dominant position compared to Montaigne, the question then arises whether the therapy-like relationship may have existed between the two men, which was misinterpreted by Montaigne. Finally, his conception of friendship is reminiscent of Plato's allegory of the cave and can be interpreted from his perspective. Having multiple casual friendships and relationships is akin to being trapped in the cave and seeing only the shadows on the walls, mistakenly thinking they represent the real world or real friendship. Only in a rare, on a very rare event that one gets to meet a suitable person and experience the unique true friendship Montaigne describes, does one leave the cave behind and experience the real world for the first time. Just like the escaped prisoner in Plato's narrative feels superior to his peers upon his return and would not want to return to his previous ob oblivious status quo, Montaigne appears to feel superior towards those individuals who have never experienced true friendship and dismisses their relationships as mere casual acquaintances of no consequence. Given the rarity of Montaigne's proposed friendship concept and the potential problems with it that we have discussed, it is possible that Montaigne's conception of friendship is a workable theoretical construct, which is plausible in itself, but which cannot be readily applied to the real world of experience most of us are caught in not least by his own definition. Like the allegory of the cave, Montaigne's focus seems to be more on the idea of the perfect friendship rather than the ability of everyday people to experience it as evidenced by his lack of trying to pursue a new perfect friendship with someone else after Laboitier's death. He seems to be content with merely elaborating on the concept in the theoretical terms for decades after his close friend's death, rather than actively seeking out a new true friend and potentially proving his own theory wrong. In conclusion, Montaigne's conception of friendship is entirely plausible as a theoretical construct, but in practical, real life, it is very difficult to come by a friend such as the one he describes. When defining friendship, not only does he rule out a concurring sexual or romantic relationship, he also rules out more casual acquaintances and professional relationships in a business context. Furthermore, he posits that women are incapable of forming the deep bond characteristic of the type of friendship he des described by him. From a real life perspective, this would limit the number of potential friends, friendship suitors to such a small number that this type of friendship is perhaps not feasible in our practical real world. Rather, Montaigne's concept of friendship reminds us of Plato's shadow world, a mere idea that is impossible to experience in the real world. Despite his apparent true friendship with Laboitier, Montaigne might have found that after the initial honeymoon period, the friendship has more flaws than initially appeared and does not meet his own stringent criteria. Due to Laboitier's untimely death, though, Montaigne clung to the idealized version of his friend that he had formed in his mind and used it as the foundation for his concept of friendship with no possibility of being proven wrong, as his cherished friend was no longer alive. 
Wow, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I prepared a few more slides uh, taken from this um, particular segment of the book. Georg, would you mind uh, maybe slowly go through them? This is the first one. If there is such a thing as a good marriage, it is because it resembles friendship rather than love. Hmm. Next one, please. The arms of friendship are long enough to reach from the one end of the world to the other. Yep. Next one, please. Friendship that possesses the whole soul and their rules and sways with the absolute sovereignty can admit of no rival. Next one, please. In true friendship, in which I am expert, I give myself to my friend more than I draw him to me. I not only like doing him good better than having him do me good, but also would rather have him do good to himself than to me. He does me most good when he does himself good. Good. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> there are no considerations in friendship other than the friendship itself. Next one, please. If you press me to say why I loved him, I can say no more than because he was he and I was I. Jim, what's your take on friendship and on Montaigne's concept of friendship? Well, thank you, uh, Georgie. I'd never heard or read Montaigne on friendship, so this was fresh material to me. Uh, so I thank you. <laughs> Uh, for it. Uh, first, I want to encourage the uh, students to uh, put their hands up so we can have uh, dialogue over the next uh, uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, what was coming to me was Aristotle mm. and uh, his notion of friendship in the Nicomachean ethics. And, uh, you know, I, I was struck by the, the the difference and wanted to have your comment because Montaigne was really into the, you know, the deep emotional, sexual, physical <clears throat> aspects of love and friendship and so forth and so on. And Aristotle didn't deal with that as much as talked about the foundation of friendship in ethics. Mm -hmm. He considered friendship to be the highest virtue and that the virtues are those aspects of behavior and attitudes that if implemented repeatedly over time improve the refinement of the soul mm. and uh, so i i was uh, just wondering where in montaigne there was a uh, a sense of the ethical dimension of friendship and that how friendship in and of itself, see Aristotle wouldn't say that friendship, as one of your last quotes uh, has mm -hmm. it, that friendship is a good in and of itself. It is, but in, in Aristotle's notion, ultimately friendship, even as the highest virtue, is instrumental for the refinement of the soul for for the pursuit of happiness so what what's your comment on on that uh complexio uh, well um i <clears throat> well i would comment on montaigne but clearly as uh, as i uh, described in the commentary section that he had just one friend and then I think he was totally blinded by anything else anything else any other relationship any other emotions was just secondary or not kind of like important utilitarian right and nothing else so um and it was in 1580 right so it is that context of time that uh, we're not uh, very familiar clearly because we are in our time but I think that um 
in his in his essay, which is this is just actually a short part that I read. It is much 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 longer. He really points to to so many re, uh, very interesting uh, uh, aspects of the friendship, which I'm sure we all experience. Because I remember that when I was a teenager, I met. Uh, uh, a friend who is still my friend uh, and I thought she's my only friend and I was super jealous when she was actually a big friend with other people and I broached this subject with her and she just said well you know one can have many friends and I was like oh that's a good point you know you're right and it is true I, in my understanding that I have many friends and one can love so more than just one that's what I what that's what I understand anyway that's how I that's how I live my life. Uh, but for Montaigne, that was uh, he was he was an essayist, right? He wasn't that that fully fledged uh, philosopher, like who was going into the depths of uh, and uh, of every concept and uh, and uh, unfolding every part of it because he was very much emotionally uh, obscured by his relationship with La Boitier. And it is so true that, that that relationship only lasted for for four years and he did idolize it so much. So for him, it, it, was, it was a very deep, deep love. But this was his conception. I think what's so good about Montaigne's essay is that it triggers you, it triggers the reader and it connects with you so much that do you agree do you disagree it is so subjective that was his point of view so great wonderful mine may be different yours may be different but yet it it starts the conversation and that's why he was such a great writer he was the proto blogger because the reader really becomes almost the writer it is it is the because you find yourself within within the essays yeah yeah uh, uh, Tally Rhodes is making a comment in the chat that perhaps Aristotle was of the mind. Uh, Montaigne is describing a union that is selfless. So would there be even the concept of virtue as the path rather than Montaigne's description of friendship as completely self-transcendent? Then ethics and virtue was not the point. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. think that that's 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 right, Tally, that for Montaigne, friendship was the point and mm. he didn't apply an ethical um frame around it or try to describe friendship as aristotle did within the larger uh domain of what contributes to happiness and well-being so it was just two different vectors uh as as georgie was just saying it was just, uh, it was different. But Georgia, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to, to, I was astonished given the sublimity of what he was talking about, his categorical statement that this wasn't available for women. Yeah. I I, I find that shocking <laughs> at two levels. One, you know, because it's just, uh, it, it deprives women of one of the most beautiful aspects of our humanity. But secondly, sociologically, I think anybody who's paying attention would observe, uh, and there may be exceptions to this, obviously, that women, and especially little girls, form friendships far easier and more deeply than little boys and men. I mean, that's been studied. Um, uh, and so just observing the human community uh, I, I, I'm surprised that a, a, a man of his intellectual acuity and elegance would make such a categorical statement. And it made me distrust everything you said subsequent to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you know, I said it so many times that that was 1580s, right? And to be quite honest with you, okay, what well, almost like 400 years passed, there is still the huge discrepancy be between males and females, right? In terms of understanding what a man can do, what a woman can't do, what we're capable, what we're not capable, and so forth. But he was he was in a very unhappy marriage, right? So yeah, he was in a very unhappy marriage, and uh, he really saw marriages just like you know, you know, 
having kids, children, and then pass the you know the shuttle on to somebody, and then that's it. It wasn't clearly his his view would have been different if he was in love with his wife. He wasn't, and whether that was passed on um from his parents or that was the social i don't know setup in 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 france that time probably so probably so he was very connected to his father less connected to his mom although his mother lived close to him apparently that he was from a very aristocratic family a rich family and that was always that you know the firstborn son is the is the is the the king the god right and daughters are are not that important. So that I think that he was what he was writing about in terms of what women capable or not. He was just portraying a, a very general view of that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 uh, it's always a little startling when when one encounters the deep provincialism and in, in past generations, even in our present day. Oh, no, totally. Uh, one thinks of Absolutely. racism, for example, and the people that 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 are very clear that one race is superior or le- or inferior to another uh, race. It's a kind but, of but shocking. You know, on another level, I think he writes so beautifully about his friendship with Laboitier, and then when you have when you experience such connection with another person, yeah. that's when you really really understand what he's talking about. I have uh, I I know people who known friends from I don't know very young age for like 40 50 years or so and have that super connection and 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 also that he says that it is involuntary it just happens so you know he does talk about spirituality he was a christian yet at the same time he didn't he didn't go much more into that that why why is that a special bond apart from that the commentary later on was describing that maybe they were intellectually so gifted they were both great writers hence the like-mindedness and uh, <clears throat> and the guy was uh, the guy Laborti was was older so it may have been that relationship almost like a you know the client and the therapist uh, these are just assumptions really but I think the point here is 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 that while one reads Montaigne's essays, it 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 really like a great art. It makes you think. It makes you feel. It makes you respond, and really observe yourself. That yeah. what, what is yeah. true to you? How do you feel about it? Do you agree? Do you disagree? If so, why not? Or why so? I think that's that's really the beauty about it. not that you know we should or we could agree with everything he said but but the 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 energy flow that he starts i think that's why he was a great writer a very sure. influential sure. one and sure. and i did say in in november that you know from pascal to rousseau to all these great uh, politicians and uh, philosophers were influenced by it and and have a copy of the night, you know, their the, you know, tables at home and, and breaching out to it because it it's really wonderful things. Either it boils your blood, what he says, that what you know one can do or one cannot do, or you or you just feel that he describes something that you couldn't, not you, Jim Garrison, but you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh Leo uh is bringing in a notion that I thought was intriguing as well, that the reader becomes the writer. Yeah. And um, uh, Thomas Hubel in his great book's presentation on the Tao Te Ching said, a sacred text contains the reader. Yeah. Uh, I think Montaigne Mm -hmm. succeeded in that uh, endeavor. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, he was an amazing artist, really. And and as I said uh, in, in November, that he was... He wasn't really writing this to anybody. He was writing it to to himself. He was talking to himself because clearly after his friend died, he must have felt super alone. And he was disillusioned with all what was happening in France after the word, the, the wars of uh, religion and, and everything. So he just uh, retired to his chateau and he was writing. He was just writing whatever came to his mind, like, a, you know, a, a blogger. Right. So, and it was kind of like, and he did say, he did say that, you know, 
I don't care what he didn't say this because this is George is saying this in a in my words that he didn't care what the readers were going to 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 say. He was just writing it out of himself. Yeah, yeah. Now Tally uh, has come back with a another domain of the relationship between Montaigne and his father. Mm -hmm. She's asking, uh, did he have sons? Uh, when he spoke of friends of, of an aspect like for beauty literature, said, I feel we all have friends that do spark different aspects of our character. Uh, and then also, you know, if he had this deep love for this uh, uh, other man, but was never apparently physically able to consummate it, that must have created both an internal frustration and and consternation, but also mm. heightened the the affect for yeah friend who was unobtainable. Yep, yeah, 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 definitely. Well, as I said in November, his father gave him a very innovative uh, upbringing. So, in a sense, that uh, right from the beginning, he was uh, he was uh, having a tutor, a German tutor, teaching him Latin. So, uh, so he, of course, he was learning French, the old French, but uh, and also that uh, he, the father, wasn't teaching him from books or rather kind of like plays and games and things like that. So the father was very clever in the, in that regard. So that triggered a lot of creativity right at the beginning uh, in Montaigne's mind. So no wonder that uh, clearly he he became what he did. So uh, at quite a, quite a young age, uh, he 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 fared so well at school and a law school as well. And he was Bordeaux's um, mayor at quite a young age, just like his uh, his his father. So um, so I think that his education played a very important role in his upbringing and the way he was uh, he was thinking and uh, and viewing the world. But he must have felt very uh, very lonely, I think after Lou that's why you know the last words of the uh, the the essay I was reading to you that he felt that he lost half of himself when Labotier died and um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he, they, they just loved each other so much, and I do believe that there exists such, uh, such love between uh, between two people. Yeah, you know, you think of David and Jonathan, the 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 line yeah. in the Old Testament that David yeah. loved Jonathan, and his love for Jonathan was greater than his love for any woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the reverse is true that you know when two women really find resonance. Yeah that the love between them can be greater than the love that they have with a man with the other. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's also an aspect of friendship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I so. think it, 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 as I said, to, that's why it is such a great art, a written art, because it, it triggers you. It makes you think that, what do you think about friendship? And so you start, that's how I felt. I started to review my friendships with, uh, with, uh, with people. And then, uh, and then how how do I feel about them? And clearly, you know, for me, the heart is so big, and then it can it can love so many in different ways because we all different, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Georgie, thank you, and thank you all for your questions and and comments. I think that'll bring us to a close for this year. Uh, this will be our final class. Obviously, uh, we're now breaking for the holiday, uh, starting at the end of the week. On humanity rising and we had our last uh, course of the year today with the great books so i want to thank everybody for joining and next year we have a, an incredible lineup uh starting in january uh where we're going to switch from montaigne and uh, uh 16th century france to uh the book called prisoners of geography mm -hmm that uh, Georgie recommended to me because uh, mm -hmm. I've been jumping up and down, uh, as many of you know, uh, about Ukraine. Uh, so I'm going to be opening our conversation around our great books uh, next year, uh, looking at geography and the way that geography shapes history, culture, languages, and events. We're going to start with a discussion of Ukraine. And then in February, 
I think we'll uh, dive into Asia and look around China and issues pertaining to Tibet. Uh, these are big issues in the public imagination and just understanding how it was, how they've been shaped by geography uh, is an extraordinary illumination. So that'll be how we start uh, 2023. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, and we'll see you uh, in January for a continuation of our great book series. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Georgie. Magnifique, you. as usual. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.